Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. Welcome to Defense News Weekly. I'm Colin Demarest, in for Andrea Scott. In this episode, a candid conversation with the Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Find out what program has him, quote, pissed off. Plus, striking footage of a cruise missile launched from the back of a special ops C-130. See a first of the Air Force's Red Dragon system. And the Air Force's Chief of Science and Technology sits down with us to talk about changes coming to the military's flying force. Also, we look at one of the earliest and largest hubs of innovation in the military, the Navy Medical Research Center. We've got those stories and more with the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Colin Demarest. Secretary of Veterans Affairs Dennis McDonough has a lot on his plate. As head of the massive bureaucracy charged with caring for America's vets, his agency is currently expanding coverage after the passage of the PACT Act. In a wide-ranging interview just before Veterans Day, the Secretary talked to Defense News Weekly about some of the major topics facing the VA. From suicide prevention to electronic health records, here's what he had to say. Jumping back to the PACT Act, yes. um, and we've talked a bunch about this as well. You've promised that, that VA is going to be able to handle the, the surge in cases, that we've got uh, the surge in benefits claims. Yes. Uh, we've seen the screening. We've yep. seen all of this. That, that's all immediate addressing folks who are coming in, folks yes. who are going to be responding to this. What, what in the legislation and what are you putting in place now for the next Agent Orange, for the next burn pits, for the next unknown illness that's going to come up so that that the next generation of veterans likely after we're all not doing this anymore right so that they don't have to have the same extended 10 year 15 year fight in order to get that recognized can yep. you can you do that can you put systems in place now so that we don't see those same frustrations and heartbreaking stories that that have to lead to a pact act being passed yeah the thing that we're really focused on as it relates to implementation of this new law that's uh, designed to ensure that anybody exposed to, toxic, ex, uh, to toxins gets care and the benefits that they need. The thing we're really trying to uh, manifest is that VA should, uh, there should be uh, many front doors in the VA, meaning Wherever that veteran comes into care or comes in to benefits, or if that veteran goes in and sees, uh, you know, I'm going to meet with uh, uh, the Arizona State Veterans Director later this afternoon. That veteran goes in and sees uh, her in Phoenix at the state level that were connected between the state of Arizona and big VA, such that wherever that veteran enters, she gets the care that she needs, she gets the benefits that she's earned. That's the way, ultimately, we're gonna be in a position to know that uh, a veteran doesn't have to advocate for himself, that some condition he's experiencing is from his service. When that, we operate not as independent silos, but we operate as an enterprise, such that when veterans come into our care at VHA and they're showing a propensity to asthma, that it's we who say to VBA, VHA says to VBA, this looks like an issue, which is why we've established this now and it's been affirmed in the bill, in the law, a very aggressive process by which we are constantly looking at what conditions our veterans are suffering from. We're using that data, including prosecuting it using artificial intelligence and other big data tools, 
to make sure that we understand where it's all manifesting so that we can react when we see something develop. That's, that's got to be the goal for us. Because until now, too often it's a veteran, or as I said the other day, a journalist like Kelly Kennedy, or like Leo Shane, who's reporting about what veterans are experiencing before we're reacting. We should be the ones who are the number one advocate for the vets. And I believe because of the way we're structuring ourselves to be veteran-centric, because of the tools we have from Congress in this new law to include our burn pit center of excellence, and when we get the trust of veterans to come enroll with us, because when we have all those vets enrolled with us, then we have the data about what vets are experiencing. Then we will be vets' best advocates, rather than making vets or increasingly, Leo, spouses or caregivers, make them be their best advocates, right? That's our challenge, which is how do we become the best advocates for vets? Related to that, uh, an issue of trust, an issue of uh, you know, how things are moving forward, the electronic health records. Yes. Um, again, covered a lot of the, the delays here, covered a lot of the yes. problems. Is there any thought in your mind at this point of cutting bait and moving on? Is the, is the, are we at a point where there have been too many delays and too many problems with this to, to say that this is just sunk money? Because that's what we're starting to hear from Capitol Hill is that yeah. this project may not have any future. Is there a point where we get to that? And are you, are you even contemplating that right now? Like we're, we're a data-driven um, operation here, right? And if we get to that point, it's going to be because what we learn from the data rather than what I learned from my emotion, okay. right? Uh, there have been many times in this office where I get very emotional about this. I get really pissed off, mm -hmm. to be mildly crude, um, because this is a massive investment of taxpayer resource, and the program and the technology is not living up to the billing. Uh, our vets deserve better. But this is not going to be a decision that I arrive at through my emotion, which can sometimes can get the best of me, but rather through this question I keep coming back to, which is the veteran experience, the veteran at the center, and then data out of that. And if it's not working for vets, we're not going to do it, right? But we're also not just going to throw it away because we get tired. You know, we're going to stay on this thing to make it work because the, the idea is so profoundly in the national interest. But if it's not workable, we're, we're not going to just spin our wheels. And in headlines from around the military, the Air Force for the first time has test launched its Red Dragon system overseas. The Red Dragon is an airborne delivery system meant to allow cargo planes like this MC-130J Commando to act like bombers by loading them with packages that can launch missiles. Called the bomb bay in a box, the system is loaded into a pallet and launched out the back to fire the weapon. Once the package steadies, the Red Dragon releases a warhead, in this case a surface-to-air standoff missile, which flies to its target. The recent test was performed at a test range in Norway by the 352nd Special Operations Wing. Further flight line testing was done in Poland the same week, in which airmen loaded the system into a C-130 Hercules. The goal of the palletized munitions, as they're called, is to allow the military more options to deliver standoff weapons in the case of a major fight where the Air Force can't fly the mission. And in the entertainment world, it's a fine time for military documentaries. Three films looking at aspects of the military are now available in your living room. The first, a Netflix documentary that looks at the murder of Army Specialist Vanessa Guillen at Fort Hood in 2020. Released this week, the film looks at the wide-ranging implications of the case. What's your name? Sexual assault scandals are the new norm for the military. Clearly an epidemic. We had no other choice but to go and fight for legislation under my sister's name. The military counts on survivors and their families staying quiet, and they miscalculated it dramatically. If we got Congress to listen, then we can get Congress to pass the bill. This is our last chance. 
they do not support the full Vanessa Keehan Act. We have to really push on them. This is not a Republican, Democratic issue. This is not a race issue. This is a human issue, so it should be everyone's issue. Second up, also from Netflix, is the story of a Marine and bodybuilder who killed her husband, also a Marine, in the 1990s. Sally didn't talk about what was happening with Ray. And I've learned to suppress things and block them out. To me, this was a premeditated murder. He was shot in the face while on the ground. I have a right to defend myself. I couldn't take it anymore. I, I didn't want to die. Killer Sally is a limited series out now. And finally, if World War II is more your pace, a documentary narrated by Gary Sinise has also hit the various streaming platforms. Into Flight Once More charts the recreation of the journey of a squadron of soldiers across the North Atlantic to Normandy in 1944. We have many people, very different backgrounds, and everyone's coming together to accomplish a common mission. We're 20 short weeks away from launch time, and when I walked in the hangar the other day, I thought, these guys got a long way to go. It's our first ocean crossing, so, you know, Put a lot of faith in our engine builder. Engine's not happy, we'll turn right around and come back. 15 individual groups of people took it upon themselves to raise the money and get their airplanes in shape, scratch out two months of their lives to honor our forefathers that uh, fought for our freedom. We'll be making one left turn to final. Copy that. That movie is available for purchase or rent. That's it from around the military. When we come back, the Air Force's Deputy Secretary of Science, Technology, and Engineering talks to us about drone wingmen and improving combat aircraft collaboration. Welcome back. As the Air Force looks to evolve ahead of its adversaries, one of the goals it's looking at is improving pilots' abilities to work with so-called drone wingmen autonomous aircraft that can carry out everything from airstrikes and intelligence gathering to electronic warfare. To get an update on where the Air Force stands with the development of that capability, Deputy Secretary of the Air Force Kristen Baldwin spoke with Defense News reporter Stephen Losey. Have a look. I'd like to dive in deeper on the issue of uh, tech transition. Um, Secretary Kendall and other officials in the Air Force have uh, put some pretty ambitious goals on, uh, on the table for uh, technology they'd like to develop. Most notably, the program that's getting a lot of headlines is the concept of collaborative combat aircraft, uh, drone, so-called drone wingmen that could fly alongside the F-35, the next generation air dominance platform to carry out everything from strike missions to uh, ISR to uh, electronic warfare to even being decoys. Um, Australia has been working on something similar with their uh, loyal wingman program. Can you talk a little bit about how your office would like to, uh, is, is working on trying to pave the way for collaborative combat aircraft to become a reality and how, how you're helping with that? We are. Uh, one of the, of course, it's an operational imperative. Uh, one of the examples for, that we did for collaborative combat aircraft is we uh, we started out, we, we leveraged technology that was maturing in our in our S&T program that was bringing to bear um, uh, autonomous uh, 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 capabilities, autonomous aircraft capabilities. Also, um, you know, autonomous- you're, you're referring to Skyborg? Yes, I was going to talk about this, our Skyborg Vanguard. Thank you. So we we initiated a program called Skyborg. We called it a Vanguard because it's a premier S and T program that has an that that is linked with not just an S and T program, but it's linked with prototyping and experimentation resources as well. And it's and it's I and it has a operational user identified and a program executive office uh, identified. So with those key elements, we have an opportunity for streamlined tech transition. Uh, and so that that's what kind of makes it a Vanguard program. This program demonstrated um, autonomous uh, collaborative software that can that that could be applied not only on the main system, uh, the main, the manned aircraft, but on unmanned platforms uh, to do diff that that may be bringing to bear different types of missions, whether it be sensing or weapons or 
or um, uh, uh, electronic attack or uh, training. And so that's what the Skyborg Vanguard did was help evaluate and demonstrate, okay, can that technology work for us? How would it work? And what are the, the what are the what are the concepts and T, concept analysis, concept of operation and TTPs really informing the trades? That whole effort then transitioned to the collaborative combat air for, aircraft program, loyal wingman that is that is now maturing and being led by our program executive office. So it's a really great example of how we're trying to uh, bring to bear um, rapid uh, capabilities in in support of the secretary's priorities. And next up, technological advances in the military aren't always smart munitions or updated optics. Sometimes it's the quiet work that makes a big impact. In this week's Miltech, Todd South looks at one of the lesser known centers of innovation, the Navy Medical Research Center. For this Miltech segment, we're gonna hit a tech blast from the past that's still with us. The Navy Medical Research Center. I know, I know, it's not the sexy tech of new bullets, missiles, battleships, or stealthy warplanes. But you know, this stuff saved a lot of lives and still does. The Navy Medical Research Center just celebrated its 80th birthday. Saving lives and bandaging wounds in a tech-driven way for eight decades, the center oversees the sea services medical, dental, nurse, and medical service, hospital, and civilian corps. And a sample of its tech-driven medical solutions, both gear and programs, include the following. The Navy Tissue Bank, early radiobiology research, astronaut training, the National Bone Marrow Donor Program, and the humble but long used wire search and recovery basket that's used to pull wounded people from danger for decades. Behold, the Stokes Wire Basket Stretcher. Early designs predate the center, and it's been in use in one form or another for about 100 years. U.S. Navy surgeon Dr. Charles Francis Stokes showcased his creation at the 1904 World's Fair. Stokes saw sailors challenged with bringing wounded back to ships during the Spanish-American War. Stretchers existed, but Stokes saw a way to combine both the stretcher and the splint, keeping the patient stabilized as they moved on rolling seas aboard small transports or on land in van-style ambulances. The Navy adopted the Baskin stretcher, and in 1910, then Rear Admiral Stokes was appointed the 14th Navy Surgeon General. Variants of the stretcher have been modified and adapted over the past century. It's pretty simple, but effective tech, at least if you ask me. See, not everything has to be digital. Though the main center is in Bethesda, Maryland, the Navy has both permanent stationing and expeditionary medical units across the globe. Since World War II until today, the center has combated infectious diseases, solving problems involving undersea medicine challenges, developed defenses to biological and chemical warfare agents, and helped rehabilitate bone marrow specifically for patients with toxic injuries from radiation or chemical warfare agents. That led to the establishment of the National Bone Marrow Program. In recent years, researchers at the center have helped develop a portable sterilizer for medical instruments, published award-winning research battling the effects of COVID-19, and they've run simple but life-saving tests of drinking water across underdeveloped corners of the globe. Typically overlooked in warfighting discussions, Miltech salutes the Navy Medical Research Center and its 80 years of important work. And to think, all of it started with a wire basket. We'll keep an eye on new and historic tech achievements, both large and small, here at Military Times. This has been Todd South. Thanks, Todd. When we come back, our personal finance expert gives us her latest tips. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack gives us her latest tips. Does your holiday shopping include buying a new car? If it does, you're in luck. The end of the year is actually one of the best times to buy a car. According to True Car, buyers who purchased a car on New Year's Eve saved an average of 8.3% off the MSRP. It's basically a buyer's market from November to December, so you'll have the upper hand at the dealership. Most dealers are putting their cars up for sale with deeper discounts so they can move their inventory and make room for more. That could mean major savings for you. And since dealers put their new cars out in the fall, by the end of the year, you'll have the most variety of new cars to choose from. The more cars there are means you have the luxury of finding the best one for you and your budget. 
So do your research, spend time online looking at pricing and options, and head to the dealership armed with information and your pre-approval. At that point, you're in control of the negotiations, and the process is much smoother and faster. Make sure you cash in on any active duty or veteran discounts they offer as well. Combine that with fewer buyers in the market, holiday discounts, and MSRP savings, your new car could be the best gift you give yourself all year. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage of military and defense issues, set your compass to Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps Times.com, as well as DefenseNews.com, and catch my articles on C4ISRNet.com. And if you want to be the smartest Marine in the Amphib, sign up for our early bird brief to get headlines delivered to your inbox each weekday. And it's even in audio. Check out the podcast version out now. When we come back, a West Point grad heads to the show The Bachelorette to try to get the girl. Find out what happened and what it's like to be a veteran on the show. Welcome back. If you're going to be on a reality dating show, is being a service member an asset or a liability? For Bachelorette season 19 contestant and West Point graduate Spencer Swise, it's kind of both. Senior editor Sarah Sicard caught up with the former artilleryman and the 25th Infantry Division soldier to talk about what it was like to be a veteran vying for a rose on the show. So yeah, you talk a little bit about how it was a, like a great experience to meet people and network and things like that. Um, is it in any way similar, like was that in any way similar to some of the way that you sort of like forge a brotherhood in the military? I've heard some people say that, like you kind of go into it like that and come out of it with a very similar experience. It, it's definitely interesting. And I will say that I had, I was very lucky. The, the cast members of my show were appreciative of my service. Um, even if, you know, they don't really fully understand some aspects of it, right? Like I, I still don't understand some aspects of what my friends do and I was in the military, right? And they, they do all these things. So um, in a brotherhood, yeah, in a sense, just because shared experiences build trust and build those bonding experiences. Um, so, you know, let's say whatever you're doing on set that day, you know, the primary focus is the, is the girls, right? So if the girls are doing something, you know, you, you don't have a lot on your agenda. So you're going to be doing a lot of hanging out with the other guys. Uh, and you don't, you know, you're not on the internet, you're not scrolling Twitter, you're not sending memes to your other friends, you get close with them very quickly. You know, similar to in a way, maybe being in the field with, you know, your unit for a month at a time, you start to talk and people open up to you. Uh, and it's not something that we, I don't think we do that enough in, in, you know, real life and especially guys in general. Um, I've had, be you know, best friends for years and, and I don't think that we've had some of the conversations that I had as I did in the army or, you know, on this, on this, on set on the show. Um, and I, I, I value that and I try to have more of that in my own personal life. If you had it to do over, would you do anything differently on the show? <laughs> differently on the show. I think I probably would have had more fun with it. Um, I, I don't want to say that nine years of military training inhibited my ability to be emotionally, emotionally vulnerable. But I will imply that, um, I, I think, and just being a guy, like maybe you're not as open as, as maybe some other, you know, being a military guy, maybe you're not as open as some other people are. Um, but I was definitely probably too self-conscious about how I was going to be portrayed or what I was saying. And I, and when you feel like in a way, um, you know, people don't watch the bachelor to get an idea of what the military is like, those two are not synonymous. Right. But, you know, some people will recognize, oh, this guy was in the military. So you might be, I might be somebody's only impression of what, you know, an officer in the military is. I might be. Um, and so that kind of weight was a little bit too stressful for me at the time. Um, and I wish I just kind of lightened up a little bit more and, and was able to show like, hey, like military has fun people too. Like we have personalities. And, and I think there was an ongoing joke that like, like, Spent, like someone said, like Spencer was like a disciplined army guy. I think someone, another cast member of mine. And then there was a tweet that was like Spencer's whole identity of being on the show. And it was like, just that. <laughs> so um, I got like roasted a little bit on Twitter, uh, but it was, it was, it's fun to see. Like, it's not, I wasn't upset about it, but they were kind of right. Um, and so um, that was interesting to navigate at the time. I, again, I just wish that I was a little bit more 
um, open and, and, and with, with my feelings and all those kind of things. Sadly, Swise did not get through to the end. Check out more of Sarah's coverage at militarytimes.com. So that's all the time we have for this episode. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. As always, thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.